Welcome to the Dr. Lexi Show, where I take pregnancy topics and break them down into simple terms to help you advocate for yourself and your pregnancy. I'm Dr. Lexi, a board-certified OBGYN and a maternal fetal medicine specialist, which just means a high-risk pregnancy doctor. And today, I have an exciting guest, Marissa Darrow. Marissa, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes, ma'am. Well, I would love, if you don't mind, for you to tell us a little bit about you and um, kind of why you're here today or just a little bit about you in general. Okay. Well, my name is Marissa Darrow, and I have two boys, and I have one on the way. Um, I'm a small business owner. I own a salon, and I've been doing that for a really long time. And we've been friends for a long time. That's kind of how I met Dr. Hill over here. So, <laughs> and she's so perfectly pregnant right now, right? Yeah. At like 20 weeks. It's or like so? the cute pregnancy like stage right now. Yeah, yeah, about 21 weeks. Yeah, I love it. It's it's just it's just adorable too. <laughs> it's just adorable. And so, Marissa, how many kids do you have at home right now? So I have two. I have a 16 year old that I had really really young. So I was a mother for the first time at 19, and now I'm 35, almost 36, and I'll be having my third. So I have my oldest, 16, who's his name's James. And then I have my little one, Bruce, who's almost five. Almost five? Yeah. I think I forgot he was already almost five. Next month he'll be five. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's insane. It goes so fast. I know. So first pregnancy was when you were young. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second pregnancy, you were in your 20s, late 20s? 30 when I had him. 30. 29, 30. Mm -hmm. And in this pregnancy, you're going to be the fun term that all the listeners are aware of this geriatric pregnancy or elderly <laughs> pregnant person, right? I like right? the advanced maternal. It uh, sounds a little bit too. nicer. <laughs> I do too. Someone, someone actually that I interviewed said they wear it like a badge of honor. Like, yes, yeah. I am of advanced maternal age. Yeah. I it, know things. I'm more, great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, My I'm husband wiser. was like, you were first a teen mom, a teen pregnancy, yeah. and now you're advanced. You've That's done right. all the things. <laughs> all the stages. All the stages. So we are going to get into a lot of topics okay. around advanced maternal age today obstetrical care in general and being pregnant and how to navigate it some, and then also some about being a pregnant mom, right? Because right. you're not just growing a baby right now. You're caring for two other kiddos at home, right? and you own your own business, and you're on your feet all day long. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to dive into all of that stuff today, okay. and I'm so, so excited to have you. Thank you for coming. Of course. Thanks for having me. <laughs> all right. So Every time that I have someone on the show, what we do is we start with some questions. Okay. And I always ask individuals, do you have any idea what I'm going to ask you? No. No, okay. no clue. Yeah. Okay. So these just Great. come out, out of nowhere. <laughs> all right. So there are 10 questions. Okay. All right. These are all surrounding pregnancy, just to see what people know. Okay. Right? Because part of all of this is trying to learn more about pregnancy, right. right? And so figure out some things that we can help to advocate for ourselves. So why not start with asking everybody on the show the same questions? All right. Okay. Okay. Question number one, what does OBGYN stand for? Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Obstetrician, OBG, gynecology, gynecologist. I don't know. Yeah. That's perfect. That's exactly it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Question number one is correct. I love it. I love it. All right. Question number two, what do the letters MFM stand for? Um, maternal fetal medicine. Oh my God, you're right. Am I? Yes. Oh my gosh. Because you know that's what I do. Yes. Right? I think kinda, yes. that's kind of why. <laughs> I feel like some people finally know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a kind of a long term. We abbreviate everything right. in the medical world, right? So, uh, yes, that's what I do. Yay. Perfect. You d- oh, well, you're two know for two. What my friend does. <laughs> oh my God. You would be surprised. Again, you know, we don't always talk about medicine, we no. talk about life, you know. That's true. That's very true. It's very true. All right, question number three. How does a provider come up with your due date when you're pregnant? I believe it's based off your your last period. Your, so your period, so the last day of your last period. And it's like based off of that somehow, right? Yes. Okay. First day of your last menstrual period, okay. you tell it to them, and then they decide with an ultrasound whether that's legit or not. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Three for three. Okay. Question number four. When is a pregnancy considered term 38 weeks oh so close 37 weeks okay <laughs> but you're not wrong okay early term okay is 37 weeks and then weeks and then you get into full term and post term okay because there's all these terms okay. surrounding the word term so okay. yeah that's still considered i would say still a good answer yeah absolutely okay. all right you're crushing this thanks question number five what is a normal fetal heart rate uh 140 that's a true statement yeah yeah it's anywhere from 110 to 160, so 140 is correct. Oh, okay. my gosh. You're, like, 
honestly killing this. <laughs> I have people who have had multiple kids that cannot get this. And yes, you, you've had two kids and now you're pregnant again, but you're like, this is fantastic. Okay. Okay. Question number six. What is antenatal testing or fetal well-being testing? Oh, that one I don't know. So you've never had that done in a prior pregnancy that you know of, right? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, so that's kind of when people have a risk for stillbirth. Okay. And then their doctor says, hey, we're going to do some monitoring in the third trimester. Okay. Now we have question number seven. Okay. How does an ultrasound estimate the weight of a fetus? Ooh, I don't know. So let's see. Do you remember? So you're almost five-year-olds. Uh -huh. um, remember when, I think they thought he was big, right? Yeah, he was okay. He was nine pounds and he was a week and a half he was early. Nine, he was big. <laughs> yeah. So when they told you before you delivered that he was kind of on the bigger side, uh -huh. the way that they do that is they measure different parts of the body. Right. They me measured the belly. And like they how, did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They measure around the belly or like the waistline, mm -hmm. around the head, okay. side to side of the head, the okay. upper arm bone, upper leg bone. It goes into this kind of calculator thing and then spits out an estimated weight. Oh, okay. So do you remember when they did that before you delivered, was it pretty accurate for when the yeah. baby was born? They yeah. were pretty spot on. Yeah. 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 And that was really cool because I actually talked to her about if I were to go past my due date, like mm -hmm. he could have been 10 pounds, Bigger. you know? Yeah. So I was concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk about that too. There's going to be some excellent information on fetal macrosomia, like if babies are measuring too big okay. and what to do about that. And one of the risks that people can have is if a baby's too big, they could have gestational diabetes. Right. You never had nope, gestational diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But you knew to make sure to ask for that because I yeah. know we talked about that, right? My husband's just really tall. So yes. he was a big baby. Yes. And that was just something I knew that could yep. happen. <laughs> and, and not to bring your husband into this or embarrass him at all, but how tall is he? He's six eight. Six foot eight. <laughs> yeah. He is not he is not a short man. He is yeah. a very tall individual. Yes. Yes. Is is uh, your almost five year old? Is he tall for his age right now? Yeah, he's always been the top like ninety eight percentile. Yeah, mm -hmm. is he gonna be a basketball player? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. He's into a t ball right now. He's Aww. been playing t ball. I so love we'll it. see. I love it. <laughs> and your older son still swimming? Yes. Yeah, yeah he's swimming. He's a great swimmer. Yeah, he's been swimming, and he's he's got his first real job right now. So he's working oh. and hustling and going to school. I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. This is a fun question. Question number eight. What makes up amniotic fluid? Ooh. Uh, well, I know, like, it's inside your uterus, and it's what the baby floats around in. Yes, I don't yes. necessarily know what it's made up of. Like, baby pee. Oh, is it really? Yeah. It's baby pee. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I know, right? First. I know uh, yeah. that. <laughs> Sometimes I've actually heard some people say they can actually see a baby, like, if they catch it on an ultrasound, no they can see I mean, I guess baby. I always wondered, like, where does it all yeah. go? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So there, you know, when people, sometimes people say like, am I high risk or low risk? That's something mm -hmm. we talk about a lot on this, in the show. And fluid levels being mm -hmm. too low or too high Is can that actually be an issue. Is that based nutrients that the baby gets then? You know, it's kind of like, so think about it. If the amniotic fluid is baby pee okay. and there's no fluid, maybe your baby's not peeing. So they might not be getting enough fluids or They might nutrients. not be making urine, oh, meaning their kidneys might not be working. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And on the flip side, if the fluid's too big, mm -hmm. so all babies really do, I mean, they move around and they do cute things, right? They uh -huh. pick up and they roll. They and kick they kick you. Yeah. They stick their tongue <laughs> out, you know, but they pee and swallow all okay. day long. Okay. So if the fluid's really high, they might not be swallowing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But most of the time, if the fluid's high, it's just random. Okay. So it doesn't really have a concern. So it doesn't mean that the pregnancy is high risk, but it does mean you should be screened for diabetes. Okay. Because higher fluid can be associated with diabetes. Okay. Because if you think about it, do you have any family members with diabetes? Or, I do. Okay. Did they ever tell you they're peeing all the time? Um, no, I didn't know that. Okay. But I knew that was a symptom of diabetes. That's a symptom. Mm -hmm. I had an animal one time that peed a lot and the vet was like, well, you're a medical person, why wouldn't you think diabetes? I'm like, because I'm not a vet. But it's also hard <laughs> to know. Like, I mean, I think women in general mm -hmm. pee more, especially after mm -hmm. you've had kids yep. and yep. then with age. Yes. So then how do you even roll that out? Right. You know what I mean? Well, but if you think about like um, anybody like that's non-pregnant that has diabetes peeing a lot, mm -hmm. think about if, if the fetus is exposed to a lot of sugar, okay. you might not know you have gestational diabetes. The fetus might, I always just kind of give it as an example. 
the fluid gets higher because they might be peeing more. Okay. Because that kind of, if you think about people non-pregnant, what are symptoms of? Right. So when people are like, well, what does high fluid mean? 60-ish percent of the time, it means nothing. Okay. 60 to 70 percent of the time. 30-ish percent of the time, it might be associated with diabetes. Okay. And then really this tiny percent, like 1% or less even, okay. are the big bad things, like the baby's not swallowing and there's something wrong with the throat or something. Why do they test you for the diabetes later in pregnancy versus like in the beginning? Yes. You know? So they're always testing about 24 to 28 weeks yeah, when you okay. drink that juice, yep. right? That's my next appointment, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's because— most of these big changes in the body are happening really big time in the second trimester right there. Okay. So anything in our world of obstetrics that's called gestational, I'm air quoting here for those listening. Mm-hmm. If it's gestational, it means it happens after 20 weeks gestation. Okay. So if you have gestational, air quotes again, mm-hmm. diabetes, it occurred after 20 weeks. Okay. And so we don't screen people in the early portion because we want to catch it if it's associated with the pregnancy. Gotcha. So that's answer number one. That makes sense. Yeah. However, so everyone should be screened for diabetes. That's mm-hmm. a true statement. And you know that because you've been screened in all your mm-hmm. pregnancies, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, perfect. Here's the other thing. So let's hypothesize and say in your last pregnancy, you had gestational diabetes. Okay. They diagnosed it at 25 weeks or something. When you get pregnant again, you should be screened as soon as you go into that oh, OB office. Wow. Okay. So earlier, kind of yeah. like you're saying, why wouldn't we screen earlier? Some yeah. people, we do screen earlier okay, because their risk is so high. Those would be people who have a very, very, very strong family history of diabetes. Okay. People who maybe had a prior baby that was big, right? Mm-hmm. Now, your story is a little different because you have a great reason. Right. You have a, a partner who is very tall. Yeah. Right? And so that might be an explanation. But if you had had gestational diabetes in that prior pregnancy, they should screen you in the first trimester during this pregnancy. Good to know. Yeah. That's cool. Also, fun fact, if you have gestational diabetes, postpartum, they're supposed to screen you again. Okay. And data recently shows only like 30% of patients get that screening. Really? Yeah. And, and I, I don't kind of forget about you after you have they, a baby, huh? They're yeah. Like, okay, bye. Yeah. And you're <laughs> supposed to have these postpartum visits, but that's part of the where people are left behind is that yeah. postpartum time. That's true. Oh my gosh. It's it's just even in delivery, like my first one, I after you had I was so young, so I didn't really know what to expect. So after I had him, I didn't even know about the afterbirth, like about the whole process <gasps> oh, of that. Yeah. And he had detached from the placenta. So mm-hmm. she had to like get in there and really like clean it all out. And I remember oh. everyone was admiring little baby James. And mm-hmm. I'm over here just, it was a lot. Yes. And I'm like, I'm here. I still need support. Like yes. somebody help me. You know what I mean? You yeah. kind of just get forgotten about. <laughs> How do you feel? And I've always wondered, I've, I've, I've never been on the person having the baby side. Yeah. I've been thousands of times on yeah. the, you know, person delivering the baby. Yeah. And for me doing a delivery, my focus, once the baby's cord is clamped and I hand yeah. that baby to the NICU team, neonatal team, mm-hmm. those people, me and mom are, I mean, that's how I've I'm felt. right there, yeah. right? Yeah. Because that's my job. Once the baby is delivered, yeah. I'm not a neonatologist, I'm not mm-hmm. a pediatrician, but I do maternal fetal. So right. I'm staying with that mom. Yeah. The fetus is now transitioning to being a neonate, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm staying with mom. And I've always noticed people in the room. Oh, no, they go to the baby. They leave the mom. Mm-hmm. They go to this baby. Yeah. Yep. And then they're taking pictures. And I'm sure the mom, like, how did, explain to me how you felt, because you've done it twice. Yeah. I want to know how it feels on your side, because me, I'm like, wow, they just left this yeah, person definitely. who is still waiting for a placenta to deliver and still bleeding. Definitely the first time I felt really abandoned yeah. you know, in that moment. And I was, and the doctor was there. I've always felt like my doctors have been there mm-hmm. during that time, but the family kind of took off and were admiring yeah. the child. With Brucey though, with my second, like they, I definitely felt the support. So mm-hmm. like my husband was right by my side, holding my hand, like obviously happy about Bruce, but he was off getting measured and cleaned up. Yeah. So he, I actually warned him ahead of time, like you can't leave me because that second part is actually just as hard as the delivery in my yeah. opinion, Yeah. you know? Yeah. I Can you think of any other time when someone's in a hospital where there are like people around when they're doing something so maybe invasive or so personal, mm-hmm. but other people are there? 
Yeah. You know, like it doesn't like it. I think in the, initially it bothered me. Like <laughs> with Bruce, I had a full room with my brother in law. Like, yeah. Love you, Steve, if you see this. Like <laughs> everyone was there just to support. And honestly, once I got the epidural, like I didn't care about anything. I was like happy everyone was there to support. But once it was time to push, mm-hmm. I kind of looked over at him and like, well, I'm like, if if you want to be here, I'm at this point. I didn't really care because mm-hmm. we're all pretty close. But then he realized it and he like ran out the room. So I was like, okay, good. <laughs> but like for me, I'm really close with my family. I mm-hmm. think it just depends on the personality. Yeah. Um. I think the most important thing is having people there that want to support you, that yeah. are gonna like push you instead of like feel sorry for you. Yeah. Like I remember somebody saying like, oh, oh dear, and I'm like, get her out. <laughs> Whoever said that needs to go. I need someone telling me like, you got this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I, I love that. I yeah. hope this next delivery goes well too, because it sounds like you're. So you're prior to overall pretty good other yeah. than like having to kind of have some what we call manual right. extraction of that no, placenta everything but everything went great and I I mean I don't feel like I had to push you know knock on wood but I didn't have to push long for yeah. either one yeah and I hear these stories of women pushing for a long time and you know even with a bigger baby like I felt like I had a moment where I'm like I don't know if I can do this yeah but I had a really good experience as far as like it happening quickly yeah did you do anything I guess for anyone listening who's like, oh, I'm doing a, I'm planning for a vaginal birth. Right. And and is there anything you did where you felt like it prepared your body more, prepared you mentally more for going through labor? I think that the main thing is you need to keep moving your body. So yeah. like, I think if you're not, if you're sitting at work all day, you should probably go on a walk or just move, move your body because that stamina is going to help you at the end. Mm-hmm. And then, like, even there's classes. I never took Lamaze or anything like that, but I do yoga. You know, I meditate on my own. Mm-hmm. So definitely, like, that helps. Um, just speak your speak your mind. Like, yeah. if you want people out, kick them out. If you want people there cheering you on, have them there. I, like, when I'm when it gets time to push, I need everyone quiet. Yeah. And I kind of warn them. Like, I, everyone can be talking. As soon as that pain kicks in, everyone needs to shut the heck up. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I need to focus on pushing. Yeah. So I feel like your body. Yeah. And I saw, I think Friends was on recently. Uh And, you know, I think quite a few people in that show during that had babies. And it's always interesting watching TV shows where people are delivering babies because there's like a screaming fest going on. And then someone's (laughs) like, shut up. Uh But I love what you say is, is it's that know what you want and just let them know, Mm -hmm. let the people in the room know, like, yes, I only want my significant other in the room. I only want my mom or sister in the room, or I want everyone or no one or right. whatever. Mm-hmm. And I I just, as a provider, I don't think there's any other specialty where you're doing a procedure, like this mm-hmm. delivery is happening and two yeah. people's lives are in the provider's hands at that time. And there's a gallery of people. Right. 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 And so like, you have to think about what you're saying and what you're doing because mm-hmm. other people are hearing it peripherally. Yeah. But you're really talking to that mom, like, hey, mm-hmm. we're on, we're doing this together. Yes. Right. And then think about two C-sections. Right. Because we typically allow one person in the room uh-huh. while a C-section is happening. Yeah. So they're at the what we call the head of the bed, so they can kind of like have eye contact with the person having the surgery. But I don't know any other surgery where someone's in the room with you, yeah. right? And honestly, I, I would have preferred less people in the room, but my family were so close that it's yeah. hard to be like, sorry, mom, or yeah. sorry. Like, I would want 100% my sister to be there, which yeah. is my best friend. And but if like during COVID, like I can't imagine my sister delivered during COVID where she could only have her, I think one person, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, they changed it all and, the time. And you know, she could only have her husband there. Of course, mm-hmm. she's gonna have her husband. But I'm like, I'm gonna go to the window and just peek yeah. in, like moral support. Like, so I, I mean, I, I would have preferred less people. But at the same time, if they want to be there and they follow the rules, they can stay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And you bring up the point too, like you have a a wonderful and supportive family. I bet there's people too who have family members where they want to be there and they're like, I really don't want them there. Yeah, right. Yeah. And being able, like, like Marissa said, to speak up and yeah. just let them know this is me. This is my birth experience. Mm-hmm. And here's my plan. And it, you're just not included in that yeah. part of it. And you know, your family and the people that like you love them, but like there are people that might kind of heighten your anxiety a bit. Right. And for me, I don't, I need that. Yeah. not to be near me yeah. at that time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I love it. Knowing what you want. Do you yeah. feel, and I, I have to keep going back to this because this is your third journey mm-hmm. to doing this. Do you feel like you have the ability more now that you're experienced and wiser and older that you didn't have then 
with regard to maybe speaking up for yourself just in general when Absolutely. you're pregnant? Absolutely. I think even besides being pregnant, as you age and get older and you experience things, I think the biggest thing is like saying no to someone else is saying yes to yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I've really like stand by because I'm such a people pleaser and I want to make everyone happy. But now I'm like, you know what? I need to say no sometimes and just like yeah. stand up for what I want and what makes me happy, yeah. you know? And for people listening to Marissa and I have been friends. I've lived in Phoenix three times. We first met, um, she cut my hair. Yeah. That's how we first met. Yep. And I flew back here when I lived in Las Vegas for her to continue to cut my hair. Yep. And then at some point too, I moved again or I moved around or whatever. And I was like, she's my friend. I mean, not that she doesn't <laughs> cut great hair too, but I'm like, this is a whole new level yeah. of just like someone I met along the way. And you have to hear too that when COVID started, and we all know like generally where we were when the world kind of started to shut down, I remember it was near my birthday time, near my 40th birthday time. Yeah. And I had to cancel the birthday party and all this stuff and people were flying in and it just happened right around the same time. And Marissa gave me a gift of a mask and it was before the masks had really been <laughs> mandated. And I remember I had I saw this picture on my phone the other day uh-huh. because it's coming up on April. And I had the mask on and I took a selfie in my car. <laughs> and I was like, I got your gift. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if I'm going to ever use it. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I forgot about that. Yes, it has unicorns on it. <laughs> oh it's gosh. colorful. And I got so many compliments on that mask. I wore it all the time. I washed it. I, you I know, love that. that was my go to mask. And oh, I was the first weirdo in the store oh. with the mask on. Like, people were like, I'm like, you guys don't understand. It's going down. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And it was fashionable. I mean, it was just like the, the best thing ever. <laughs> and so, anyway, that's, that's the kind of friend Marissa is. She will watch your back for that and have you do it in style yes, as you gotta, well. You got to keep it cute. That's right. You that's try. right. And then, and also, just a side note, we've talked some, we've touched a little bit about like, you know, as we've gotten older, really feeling like we've grown. And I will say like, of all my friends, Marissa and I, I feel, have grown together. Yeah. Like, not like we're having the exact same journey, but like, hey, I'm really reflecting on this. And right. hey, I'm working on myself. Right. And here's how I'm doing it. How are you doing it? And like, we'll recommend quotes and right. stories and books mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's important great. like we stick together, you know, I think we're both people that want to grow and learn in humanity in every way, you know, in friendships and we all have room for growth and it's kind of beautiful to see how much we've evolved as people and friends and everything. Yeah. 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 I I love it. I love you as my friend. Me too. (laughs) Okay. Question number nine, who should be screened for Down syndrome during pregnancy? Anyone over the age of 35 or should everyone? Everyone. Everyone. Yeah. (laughs) Question number 10, what is considered a normal length of a cervix in pregnancy? Oh, that's interesting. It's interesting, yes. Now, and I, I've, I've mm-hmm. learned now that I'm asking this to people, I should ask it more clearly. What is the normal length at 20-ish weeks? So you just had your 20-week scan recently, yes, right? Did they I, check the they length did, of your cervix? They did check it, but I wasn't paying attention to that. <laughs> so does your cervix change when you're pregnant? Well, so yeah. I didn't even know that. Because here's the thing. So when you go to deliver, mm-hmm. I mean, the cervix is what opens, right? Okay. So over time, it's ultimately going to get shorter and then open. Oh, uh, that makes uh. sense. So you know how like when they check your cervix when you're in yes. labor and they rattle out a bunch of numbers? Uh-huh. Do you ever know what those numbers mean? No. So there's three numbers they use. They'll okay. usually say 380 minus one. Okay. Three is how many centimeters dilated you are. Right. That's the first number, like of your cervix, how far dilated is it? The second is what percent thinned out is the cervix? Okay. And that's the effacement of the cervix. So when people, there are these great videos online where they show like a donut or something and they show the donut kind of getting squished more and then the hole in the middle getting bigger. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All the things our body does. Yeah. Oh, it's insane. (laughs) And then the last thing is that um, it's how far down the baby's head is. Okay. So is the head starting to come down further into the maternal pelvis? Makes sense. Yeah. So there's three different numbers for that. So the cervix in the third trimester can do kind of a lot of changes. And in labor, it's definitely changing. Right. Okay. But when people are around 20 weeks and get their cervix checked, it should still be what we call closed yes. and long. Yes. And so how long should it be? Um, I don't know. Let's just guess. Are you want me to do centimeters or inches? Oh, centimeters. Thank you for asking. Oh, okay. Well, we use centimeters in medicine. We don't ever use inches. I don't, it's frustrating. I know. 
six, I know. seven centimeters. Great, great guess. It's a, we want it to be above 2.5 centimeters. Okay. And then above three is even better. Okay. So what's so, the longest someone's cervix can be on average? I have seen like around five centimeters, okay. but that's like excessively long okay. in all honesty. And sometimes there's a contraction in the lower part of the uterus that makes the cervix look longer. Okay. Because the uterus is like what we all think about where the baby's growing. Mm -hmm. The cervix is really the most inferior or the most bottom part of your uterus. Right. So you're never meant to look technically at the length of a cervix in a pregnancy prior to really 16 weeks. Okay. Because you can't decipher the cervix from the uterus that right. well because it all kind of looks to mush together. Okay. Isn't that weird? I yeah. know. This changes so much. And so as you're, you're about to deliver, it gets smaller and you start to dilate mm-hmm. and then you deliver. And then how does it rebuild? It just like magically. Magic. Over time. You know? Yeah. But, you know, it doesn't <laughs> just bounce back Right. Originally, Next right? Because remember, after you delivered, when they couldn't get the placenta out and they had to manually right. extract, right? This is going to sound very aggressive, but this is what happens. Yeah, the delivering physician or delivering provider would have a glove on and a sterile yeah. gown, and if the placenta doesn't deliver in a certain amount of time, and they have to go extract it, they the entire hand oh, yeah. is oh, yeah. in the vagina through the cervix to the top inside part Mm -hmm. of the uterus. And we're trying to like break off the layer or I guess get the hand between where the placenta and the uterus are to kind of wiggle in there and and gently help remove that. And if it all doesn't come out that way, then sometimes people need what we call a curatage just to scrape it. To get it out. And if you don't get that out, that's very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. You could continue bleeding and have some issues with retained placenta. Yeah. You don't, no one wants that. That could be bad. And then after everything's out, you'll still have some bleeding and whatnot. And then the cervix starts to reform into this closed thing, right? That's crazy. It's crazy. It's cool. It's insanity. All right. Those were all of our 10 questions. Now we have 10 kind of rapid fire true false questions. Okay. All right. Question number one, true or false? A fetus can have hair in the womb. True. Very good. Question number two, true or false? A fetus can hear. True. After a certain period. Yes. After 25 weeks. God, you're so good at this. (laughs) Do you need a job? I think you should go into healthcare now. Um, Okay. Question number three, true or false? If a pregnant individual eats sugar, this will wake a fetus up. If they're sleepy. Oh, um, I would say, I don't, yeah, maybe. This one's kind of, I've had people go back and forth on it. Yeah, and babies go through sleep cycles. So if they're sleeping, nothing you technically ingest is going to change it. But you can kind of do a little like gently like wiggle on your belly to kind of like move them a little Mm -hmm. bit to try to wake them up. And vibrations. Movement, I would say, makes them... You know, when you're rolling over or changing positions, then they move. But Doing yeah, stuff. Guess, right. Yeah. It's not like when you eat a donut, they're going to start jumping around. In Correct. There. Correct. <laughs> that is a, true. And I have heard patients tell me that someone told them or maybe the internet told them to eat sugar before they came in oh, for an really? ultrasound to prepare. And I'm like, no. However, you shouldn't ever starve yourself when you're, you know, going in for visits or appointments. Eating regularly throughout the day is an important thing. It's a must. I yeah. was going to tell you too, like – um, one of the, like the tips I would say is with nausea and that kind of thing, always have a snack on hand. Yes. Even by your bed at night, because I'll wake up, you know, three o'clock in the morning and I'm hungry. Yeah. And so I got to keep a banana or something and it helps me to not be nauseous in the morning. Such if a good point. I yeah. don't eat, if I wake up and I'm nauseous or I kind of feel like, oh, I'm hungry and I don't eat, I'm nauseous in the morning. Very good point. So it does help. And, you know, having a little bit of a snack by the bedside is great because. For those people that have nausea, Mm -hmm. if you have an empty stomach and you're nauseous, that just makes it worse. So you always like to have almost like this little bit of food in there, just something. And I'd forgotten, and my sister reminded me with this pregnancy. I'm like, gosh, I'm just, she's like, you need to keep a banana by your bed. Remember when you told me that? I'm like, oh, I forgot. (laughs) I forgot everything. I'm glad that you have her. And she has two small kids right now. Yep. Right? Okay. Okay. Two in diapers. Y'all are doing this together. Yeah, this is so goodness. exciting. Takes a village. So exciting. <laughs> All right. Question number four. True or false? Everyone should be screened for diabetes when pregnant. True. Love it. Question number five. True or false? Everyone should be screened for thyroid disorder when pregnant. Um, true. 
This one's false okay. currently. A lot of people get screened from their OB office, but they, it's not mandatory, and they're okay. not meant to have to do it because the thyroid can change some, and it makes the lab values a little wonky sometimes. Okay. Question number six, true or false? Someone with two prior cesarean births has to have a third cesarean. I heard that it used to be that way, but it's not anymore. Correct. Okay. That is correct. You are spot on. Question number seven, true or false? Twins that are the same gender are always identical. False. Very good. All right. Question eight, true or false? No cheese is safe to eat while pregnant. False. Correct. Pasteurized cheeses are safe. Uh, false. Oh, sorry. That was just like a FYI. Fat pasteurized or safe. Okay. <laughs> Do you like cheese? Like, are Love you a cheese, cheese eater? Okay. Had some cheese last night. It was great. <laughs> cheese. Cheddar. I feel like this is a good advertisement for like the, the cheese people. It's like, <laughs> if you guys want to use some of this, feel free. Yeah. <laughs> All right. True or false? Someone trying to get pregnant should start taking folic acid before pregnancy. True. Very, very good. And then last question here, true or false, baby aspirin is an over-the-counter medication that can prevent a certain type of high blood pressure in pregnancy. True. Wonderful. I think you aced practically everything. Yay. All right. So I want to get into a little bit about your job and how you do your job while pregnant. How do you do that? How do you stand on your feet all day while you're carrying and growing these these little lives? I mean, I think number one, shoes. You got to have some comfy <laughs> shoes. Um, I used to have a bigger scale salon. Uh, I, I downsized a couple of years ago. And when I had the larger scale salon, I had an assistant. I needed mm-hmm. one. Um, as a hairstylist, you know, you're on your feet all day long. Yeah. You're not, you never sit down. You're never stopping. And so having an assistant with blowouts and things like that or ringing clients up really helped. Now I'm lucky I can kind of manage my time a little bit more. So I, as I'm getting closer to my due date, I'm just um, lowering my, you know, not not working as many hours. And then I have a little chair I can sit on when I do yes. cuts and things like that. Um, but yeah, shoes are definitely important, you know. True. And then once I get home, rest your feet. Love it. Do you put your feet up at night when you get home? 100%. I have to. Yeah. Have, do, have you seen those squeezers that you can get for mm-hmm. your legs? I'm going to have to get you a pair. Oh, wait. No, I do have I, I, do you I have, have this? one, but I haven't. I'm so bad. I have it, but I haven't like, haven't used it yet. Used it. Okay. We're going to have to get those. Like, And you plug them in, right? Yeah. It's that kind, and then mm-hmm. they just intermittently squeeze. We mm-hmm. call them sequential compression devices sometimes. It's kind of, like what, if you're going into surgery in the hospital, yeah. that kind of thing. I have yes. one. I got it. Mm-hmm. I think those are great, especially if okay. you— I need to bust that out. Yeah. It. And like when you're watching TV at night, yeah. you just put them just on. why not? Yeah, it helps move that, you know— fluid around if you have fluid that's building up in your legs. Also, just helps with the blood flow. Mm-hmm. It'll make your, because you, put, it, does yours go around your feet and yeah. your calf? Yeah, yeah. Those are fantastic. I yeah. love those. And I will say, like, when I was 19, pregnant, I, nothing hurts. Like, nothing hurts when you're young. I'm <laughs> right? sorry. Like, so the older you get, like, besides being pregnant, you're, you're on your feet all day, you're going to feel it. So yeah. being pregnant, it's even more. Yeah. So luckily, For sure. my clients are awesome and they get it and I they're very it. flexible. I love- <laughs> so, when you're so you own your own salon, I do, right? Yeah. So like, I'm in the world now of being an independent contractor, mm-hmm. right? So and in the past, I was always employed by a company, right? And they covered my insurance, That's and I great, never, great. I never mm-hmm. thought about what to do with insurance because I, the company did it. I never right. had to think about it. So how do you navigate that while you're pregnant? Like that's a huge, that work? huge subject. So. Rob and I, my husband and I, are both self-employed. So when we decided we were going to have another one, it's 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 big planning as far as insurance goes because we use, especially you know, there's different laws in different states, but in Arizona, to get a you know private um, plan, mm-hmm. it's close to impossible. You have like two options basically, and so we use a broker, an insurance broker that shops yeah. around for us. So when we decided we were going to get pregnant, we had to think, okay, what plan? are we going to need to cover the bases? And also, big thing, figure out what doctor, what physician you're going to have first, what they take. Yeah. Then try to work with that. Because I've had it where my insurance halfway through my pregnancy switches because that insurance no longer is working or whatever. And my doctor doesn't take it anymore. So that right. happened with Bruce, ha- like not halfway, but you know, in the early stages of pregnancy, I had to switch doctors. Mm-hmm. And I love my doctor now, but I was with my other doctor for over 10 years. And so all of a sudden now I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to find another, 
you know, doctor to deliver my baby that I don't know. It was, and it was just your insurance that that yeah, they just, made that change. or that, they, they changed yeah. it. It wasn't like I wanted to change my insurance. They're like, okay, we're not we're not going to help self-employed individuals anymore, so you got to figure it out. Wow. So it's really something that you have to think about before you're going to start getting pregnant. Cause you, and then it's like, you know, it's not cheap. You yeah, think no. you're going to hit your deductible 100%. Yeah. And so I could have done everything cash, but I don't want to risk anything either. Yeah. And so I, we decide, okay, we're going to up our insurance. We're paying probably double now to mm-hmm. have me have better insurance. Yeah. And then we'll hit our deductible for sure. So then let's talk because part of, and Marissa knows what I've been working on doing with with my company and, and trying to help pregnant individuals. So your pregnancy now, as far as trying to decide if there's anything high risk, sounds mm-hmm. like the only thing is really age related. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of OB providers are, comfortable managing that and not sending you to like a high risk provider. Right. You know, because, you know, you're 35, like the range of advanced maternal age is 35 and beyond. Right. So if you were closer to my age in your mid 40s, they might be like, hey, let's get you to someone else just to kind of like cover more bases, etc. So if you're someone like Marissa, who's seeing an OB provider, and you're right at that 35 year age mark, and you're not seeing a high risk provider, but you want to, and you just want some extra counseling or right. another physician to talk to you about that. That's where some of my services would come in right. to just be able to go to the website and say, hey, I want to do a consult with you, and I'd like you to give me the full rundown on advanced maternal age. I'm doing air quotes. I always do air quotes when I talk about advanced maternal age and go through what are the risks and what are the things that should be done for me in the pregnancy. Right. And so if we were to go through that today, I would say, hey, growth restriction could happen. I mean, you need to have a growth ultrasound in the third trimester. So as Marissa's friend, I will probably just say, hey, make sure you have that growth ultrasound in the third trimester, right? And then the risk of stillbirth can Mm -hmm. increase just a little bit Mm -hmm. for 35-year-olds and then much more for those 40 and beyond. Then we'll get into fetal monitoring or well-being testing, which is kind of what I asked her about before, that she never had to have in a prior pregnancy. But probably will get and should get during this pregnancy, but at what gestational age. And that's for your doctor to decide. Right. There's not an exact exact decision. It's individualized, we call it. But that's what we're, she and I will talk about. That's what I could talk about with anybody listening who just is like, hey, I need that little bit of extra information. Right. Because how to advocate for yourself. Marissa and I have been friends, so she already knows to ask this question. And we've talked about it just when we're out having dinner or coffee from time to time. But if you don't know how to ask that question, that's what I can kind of provide for you. And Marissa's actually been able to do some of the modules online and look through them. The one for her particular kind of thing during pregnancy, I don't like saying issue all the time. It's not an issue. It's just like, you can't change your age. It is what it is. (laughs) But it's, you can find those at drlexihill.com backslash pregnancy dash modules. And that will get you to the place where you can find these modules. And one of them is on advanced maternal age. And I have to say, not just because you're my friend, I actually really love what you're doing. Um, My doctor wanted to send me to a, you know, another uh, clinic or whatever, um, another doctor. And I was, I thought of you obviously. And I love that I could do it from the comfort of my home. It was very educational. It was easy, easy yeah. to understand. And I did learn a lot. Like I, I, I'm i glad I have you and I know that this is out there. But even if I wasn't advanced maternal, I would want to do something like what you're doing and what you're providing. Because nice. it kind of like they leave you in the dark when you're pregnant. Yeah. You know, you don't really know what to ask. So yeah. you kind of help with that. Yeah. And even if you don't have what we kind of like to decide, you know, high risk or low risk or We've talked all the time that no pregnancy is without risk. If you don't have what's considered a higher risk pregnancy, you can still get the questions to ask, which I would say everyone needs to get. And those you can get at drlexihill.com backslash advocate. And that's just the 13, like not the, but it's 13 questions to ask your OB provider to get you started. And there's a little note section and check boxes because, you know, I'm organized. I like to have that. But it just kind of gets you started on that conversation a little bit. Yeah, and you know? I, I don't think it's like either like, you know, there are risks and I don't think it's to worry you. It's to inform you. Like yeah. knowledge is power. I feel like if you know what could happen, then you can, you know, possibly prevent it or just be yeah. aware of it. Yeah. So why not? And that's the whole point. That's why we're doing all this. Yeah. And since Marissa is here, I want to pick her brain a little bit more. There are some YouTubes you can find too about doing your hair and hair dyes and stuff like that in pregnancy that Mm -hmm. I've put up. And I've consulted with Marissa on these before, and we've talked about them. But 
do you have clients that you work on their hair and they're pregnant? Yeah. Yeah. So I've had a lot, especially in the last few years, a lot of my clients have been starting to have babies. Yeah. And they're like, oh, what do I do? Can I color my hair? Um, The thing is, is like, you know, depending on what you believe, it's really based on, you know, what your preference is, what your doctor says. But ultimately, like the chemicals we use are not as harsh as they were back in the 80s. If you feel uncomfortable, you can wait till your second trimester. That kind of helps give it a little time. But um, it's really, it's not dangerous at all. Like the amount of peroxide is very low. There are brands, like Formisi has a color, odor-free, you know, What's option. the brand again? Formisi. They have a okay. vegan line. Now, if you're trying to cover grays, it's not going to, I mean, I know, sorry, Formisi, you're supposed to cover grays. But, you know, depending on if it's resistant, yeah. like it can be trickier. But, you know, you can foil. If you use foil instead of having it directly on your scalp, that can help. Definitely have like a ventilated room. Like you don't want to be enclosed. I have a Dyson air purifier, so I turn that on full blast oh. whenever oh. I'm doing color, especially with someone who's, you know, pregnant. Those are some things too. And that's, so when, if someone, I guess, let's say they move to a different city and they're pregnant and they had, and they're not going to fly back to their hairstylist right. and they need to find a new person. Can you just maybe a couple of questions that mm-hmm. they could ask out the gate? Because you said things that you do, which are absolutely fantastic, mm-hmm. but things that they could kind of, before they end up sitting in someone's chair right. and they're like, this isn't right. What should they ask before they book that appointment? I would definitely ask, like, is it is the salon going to be ventilated or do you have a fan that I'm, you know, let them know you're pregnant. Yeah. Um, you're feeling a little nervous and, you know, maybe like what color line do you use? Do you feel comfortable with the amount, like the level of peroxide in it? But the biggest thing, like just having an open space and having a fan going is important. I will say if you do Brazilian blowouts or perms, relaxers, you cannot do them when you're pregnant. I would not recommend them. They have a lot higher level of formaldehyde in them, so they can be toxic. Are there any that don't have formaldehyde in it? I think there are some brands that say they're lower, huh. but I steer a clear of those. Even before I was pregnant, I don't even do Brazilian blowouts because I don't want to, if I'm doing them all day long, it's just not good for my, you know, have my lung issues as well. Yeah. But I would just steer clear. It's nine months. Your hair can be a little frizzy for a minute and then you can back, you know, jump back on that. I don't, I'm, I'm going to show what I do and don't know about hair care. I don't really know what a Brazilian blowout is. Can you so tell us what it is? It's basically a treatment that it, it smooths out your hair. So if you have curly hair or frizzy hair, it's a great treatment to make your hair really silky and straight. Mm-hmm. And it works wonders, but it does have a lot of, you know, chemicals in it that okay. they say to wait while you're pregnant. Plus, it could possibly not even work properly because of the hormones and all the things like that can affect. How long if someone gets a Brazilian blowout non-pregnant just in general? Yeah, how long does it last? I want to say about eight months. Oh, okay. Depending, six to eight. So, like, does it make it to where when you dry your hair, even if you have straighter hair, but it's frizzy straighter hair? Mm-hmm. Is that a thing? Is, am I saying that wrong? No, no, no. Can, can they— when you dry your hair, then you don't need to flat iron it? Basically, it's just not going to, yeah, you don't have to flat iron it or it's not as frizzy. Okay. Okay. And I think it's more like six to eight weeks, actually. Sorry. Wow, that's okay. That I don't do that. them. I, yeah. They've been around for a long time and they're great. They're great money makers, but I just, yeah. I didn't want to be doing okay. them all day. I didn't, because it, so in general, if you get one, does it take a long time to let the chemical sit? Like, are you in the salon for yeah, a while, it like takes hours about four, or something? Four to six hours, depending. No, what? like four hours, four wow. hours. Depending on how much hair you have. Yeah. So it's like a whole thing. And you can That's smell, like, you can smell it. You can smell the chemical. <laughs> wow. Okay. I didn't know any yeah. of that. So when I okay. was pregnant okay. with Brucey, I actually had the stylist, I, you know, I told them, because some of them do the Brazilian blowouts. I said, if I'm in the salon or anyone pregnant, I don't want them going on in the salon at all. So now you bring up a great point, too. Mm-hmm. So as the person doing, like, being the right. business individual— when you're doing di- dye jobs, is that the right way to say it? Di- yeah, dye color, jobs, hair. color. When you're doing color, what do you do for yourself while you're pregnant and working on on? I, I just have my my Dyson air purifier full blast. Okay, so I just have it spinning, yeah, like going. moving the chemical, the fumes yeah. out of my face. You know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like it. It helps. Marissa also mentioned a little bit about her lungs, mm-hmm. and so I think for anyone listening to that has any kind of respiratory issues, particularly kind of like asthma, Mm -hmm. upper airway type things that you are dealing with too. The one thing I think that people hear a lot or see on the internet, and I've talked with this about other people, is like, who is your source, right? So when you, I turn to the internet a lot for things because it's easier. This is one example. So if you're taking asthma medications, I'm going to just say asthma is a general term. It's kind of more common, I think, for people. Mm -hmm. If you're taking asthma medication, 
you can still take certain asthma medications in pregnancy. Right. So if you were to go to the internet, do you feel like you've seen things that say the opposite? Or what kind of info have you, I guess, seen or found about lung issues in pregnancy on the internet? You know, that's funny. I haven't really looked. I haven't really searched a lot of lung stuff. I, you know, for me, it's like you have to breathe. So, you know, I, I don't take anything daily anymore. Thankfully, mm -hmm. I just have my emergency inhaler. But I, I was a little nervous, like, about doing if, – if I had a flare-up, like, you know, I had a little bit of a lung flare-up. Do I – am I okay to take albuterol or do a treatment? I know how that makes me feel not being pregnant. So, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I haven't really researched a lot of that for yeah. myself. I'm hoping that I'll need it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. And you can tell when someone has a certain medical thing going on because they know the terms. Because mm -hmm. she's like, treatment. That's mm -hmm. a breathing treatment, right? right. She mm -hmm. goes, my inhaler. And then albuterol, that's the same thing, right? Like it's this right. little, we call it an MDI, metered dose mm -hmm. inhaler. It's your puffer. Some people right. say they're puffer or whatever. So you know when someone is a patient with lung issues because <laughs> they have the terminology, right? right? Of all that kind of stuff. So honestly, too, we talked before, there's a whole separate video I've done about what makes a pregnancy high risk. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they talk about is like the pregnant individual, if you go into pregnancy with something like a medical issue. Right. And you're coming into pregnancy with respiratory issues. Right. So. I was really nervous about it. I mean, I, I had valley fever a couple years ago and besides having asthma and things like that. So I was nervous if I got a flare-up, which is basically like a bacterial pneumonia type thing or a bronchitis that I kind of have like what, every six yeah. months now. It's pretty, it's a lot better. But like, what do I do? Can I take an antibiotic? Is it safe? Like, I was hoping it didn't happen, and it did happen. And right. I felt I feel a lot better, but like, it was a little scary. And you reassured me that like, it's okay, it's safe. Like, you got to do what you got to do to be healthy for the baby. But yeah. it's definitely something like you got to think about before and just yeah. mentally prepare. You know, what are you going to do? And Marissa brings up Valley Fever, which we live in Arizona, so a lot of people that don't live in Arizona might not know what Valley Fever is. Um, for the medical professionals, if anyone is watching that's a medical professional, it's coccidiomycosis. And dogs can get it a lot here because yeah. they get it from the spores that are in the dust. So a dog that kind of roots around in the dust gets it a lot. My prior dog got it. Yeah. So animals here, have you ever had an animal with valley fever? Not that I know of. No. They, it's pretty common. But it's very common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they have to treat them with these antifungals. It's like a fungus that people can get. And a lot of people in Arizona have been exposed to this. And some right. people kind of clear it and do fine. And then they check these things called serologies. It's like, oh, I never knew I had it. Some people can get sick mm -hmm. when they get it as well and really get a chronic, not so awesome cough. Right. And it can really like do bad things to the lungs. Mm -hmm. And so if you live anywhere, California, Arizona, Nevada area, you've probably heard of it. They call it valley fever, mm -hmm. right? Because it kind of comes over and then settles in the valley, comes over the mountains and settles in the valley. If you live on the East Coast, you're going to be like, I've never heard of this at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a medical student listening, you're like, oh, that was on my USMLE. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I got that question right or wrong or whatever, because it comes up. So with the lung stuff too, inhaled corticosteroids are going to be safe to use if okay. people need them. And then what Marissa is talking about is albuterol, which is a short-acting beta agonist. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what the side effect is, but you probably already know. Mm -hmm. Did it make your heart rate go up and make yeah. you shaky? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what it does. That's yeah. part of it. And that can be people that are pregnant, their baseline heart rate goes up about 10 to 15 beats per minute. Okay. So you already might feel like your heart goes a oh, little yeah. faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so if you then have to take a puff off mm -hmm. of your albuterol inhaler, that might bump your heart rate up even higher. Mm -hmm. So if you're having to use it a lot, that's the time when you have to jump over to something else like an inhaled corticosteroid. Right. And then these are things like, uh, thankfully Marissa is in her 30s now because if she was 17 in the midst of doing this, you might not know those things to like mm -hmm. tell your provider. Yeah. I've seen people come in oftentimes younger, but not always, that are using their All inhaler the like five times mm -hmm. a day. Oh, yeah. And, you know, their heart is just racing because they don't know that's a side effect. Right. So those little educational things. Also, do you have a spacer now? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. So this is going to be fun for anybody watching maybe. So spacer, you know what a spacer oh, is? Yes. The thing where you like blow the air through it or no? Nope. The thing you put on your puffer. 
to no, create you did space. Tell me I this did a tell long you time ago. I did. I just haven't gotten one. So you can get online and buy them. Okay. And it's like a plastic cartridge type thing. It's like a plastic link, I guess you could mm-hmm. say, between the actual puffer and your mouth, uh-huh. so that you can have space. So they call it a spacer when you push the medicine until it hits your mouth. Why don't they just give you that with the inhaler? Why don't they? Like, I don't know. Save us a lot. Like, yeah, because it's all just going in your mouth or on your teeth if you're not doing it right. And you're swallowing it because it mm-hmm. hits the back of your throat and then yep. you swallow the majority of it. Yep. And you're not getting much of the actual aerosol, port, like the yeah. medicine itself. And they charge, if you go through insurance, I think spacers can be They're expensive. kind of expensive. Mm-hmm. So I just tell people to take a piece of paper and roll it up. Yep. And then you put the medicine. It's like the letter L. Kind of you put it in there and If you're balling put on, on your a lips. budget, this is what you That's do. That's right. Right here. Or if you're somewhere where you don't have it. Which yeah. Which we were out to dinner, I think, once. And you're like, hold on. Let me make you a yeah. spacer. <laughs> so it kind of helps. Then they have these things called P-E-F-M. Peak expiratory flow meter. No wonder. A peak an expiratory flow what meter. Called. EFM, whatever. <laughs> but an expiratory, like a flow meter, is one that you can— these you can buy. I bought one on Amazon before. You know they have them digital now? Yeah. Yeah. I've never bought one because— I have a digital Did it one. work well or yeah. does it work well? I think it does. Okay. And you can have it on your phone, so then you can just keep track. Oh. And then when you go see your doctor, you're like, this is what I've been— Rad. Okay, this is a huge mm-hmm. thing, guys. For anybody with respiratory issues, knowing about the spacer, number one. Number two— getting an expiratory flow meter yeah. that you can have so that when you go to your doctor, you're not just saying, oh, I'm using my rescue inhaler a bunch. You can mm-hmm. say, hey, look, here's what it looks like when I try to blow into this peak yeah. expiratory flow meter. And then you have your numbers to and show that's them. keeping track of basically how, how much, how your lungs are working. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. And, and when you're blowing as hard as you can, how much air are you able to get out yeah. to show them this number? Now I'm curious, like so, somebody with regular lungs, if they did it, like where, how easily mm-hmm. they would. Oh, yeah. It, that little. Right. It's off. so funny to like, if you saw someone with normal lungs and someone with like not awesome lungs doing it at the same time, like they're blowing as hard <laughs> as they can. And one of them, you just see like, whoo, yeah. look at all this air. And the other one's like, nothing's coming out. They're like turning red because they're just blowing so hard trying to yep. push this air out and it just doesn't happen, right? And so, yes, I'm glad we got off on that little bit of a tangent because yeah. I think that lung health is so important and you don't have to always go see a pulmonologist. You can continue care with your right. OB provider if they're comfortable in that space. Mm-hmm. They can also send you to a maternal fetal medicine specialist to kind of help navigate that too. Yeah. So I love that. Okay. Well, let's see. We have touched on insurance, working moms, deliveries, bigger bait. We've touched on a lot today. Yeah. We did a lot of good stuff. So for me, everything I'm trying to do with this, the three pillars, as you might know, number one, expanding your knowledge. Today we did that. We got into information about a lot lot of definitions. Mm -hmm. We got into a lot about hair during pregnancy too, which is a fantastic like topic to go into as well. We talked about insurance. We talked about all the answers that Marissa got right too (laughs) and definitions of that as well. We developed some skills as well, questions to ask, not only if you're going to get your hair done, but if you're going to your doctor, how to advocate for yourself with asking the big questions on when certain things are going to get done. And then finally, I, that's our impact that we want to have. So the whole point of doing this is trying to have some type of an effect, a positive effect on anyone who's watching for you and your pregnancy. And as always, I like to try to ask my guests, if you were to, like, you hear the word impact and it's like, regarding your pregnancy or a pregnancy of someone that's watching this, what is it that you think they can do to really have an impact on them and their pregnancy? Oh my gosh, that's a loaded question. But I I think, I honestly just think it's like, listen to your body and put like, I, you know, being a working mom, a wife, a businesswoman, you got to remember to put your health first and what your needs are. And it's the hardest thing to do, even not pregnant. So you know, just remember to do self-care and do what feels right. Like follow your heart. My sister says, follow your heart. And it sounds so cheesy, but it's true. Like listen to your body. If you can't go to the party, you can't go to the party. Yeah. If you can't take the client, you can't take the client. I think that's the biggest takeaway that I've learned from being younger and older is what what can I handle and just listening to what I need right now. Right now it's about me and the baby. Everything yeah. else can wait. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And do Thank what you, you. got to do to yeah. get through the day, man. Do it. Do it. <laughs> and I, I love that we got to talk about self-care too. Yeah. Like 
there, do you use any, I got to get asked one more time for when you talked about some meditation and kind of having time for yourself, do you use any apps or anything There's like that? The Calm app that's really good. That one's good. Um, even on Spotify, they have like meditation, like yeah. five minutes meditation. It, honestly, I do mine before bed, like because I have a hard time falling asleep. So mm-hmm. I just kind of try to listen to my breathing and calm it down. Yeah. I'm a more active person. So I think for me, it's good to slow the mind down and quiet the brain. Yeah. But I try to do that. And there's a lot of stuff on YouTube too that's free and easy to find. I love it. Okay. All right, guys. Well, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If there are any other things you want to hear about in the future, any guests you want me to bring on, please leave comments below as well. As always, don't forget to go to drlexihill.com backslash advocate to get your free download for 13 questions to ask your OB provider. As always, I'm Dr. Lexi, wishing you a happy and healthy pregnancy.